Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am Raina Edgar. I am the Director of Education and Programs at the Arkansas Arts Center. And on behalf of the staff at the Arts Center, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our first of many virtual artist talks for the Delta exhibition. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment just to ask you all to please make sure your microphones are muted. This will make it so much easier for us to be able to hear the speakers today. Also at the end of the presentation today, we will have a Q&A time. Um, if you could please use the chat feature, if you have questions, you can type your questions in the chat at any time. Our Arts Reach Coordinator, Lindsay Knight, is monitoring that and she will have um, all the questions prepared for our speakers at the end of the presentation. I'd like to take a moment to thank our supporters for this exhibition. Thank you to Ms. Lizzie and Rockefeller, Terry and Chuck Irwin, Judy Fletcher, in memory of John R. Fletcher, Friday Eldridge and Clark, LLP, J.C. Thompson Trust, Diane and Bobby Tucker, AAC Contemporaries, Bank OZK, Phyllis and Michael Barrier, East Harding Construction, Marion W. Folk, Barbara House, Don Tilton, and the Andre Simmons Memorial Trust in memory of everyone who has died of acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Our grand award is sponsored by the John William Lind Endowment Fund. As I mentioned, this is our first um, artist talk and throughout the run of the exhibition, we will have a number of studio tours and artist talks. I hope you will mark your calendar and visit the Arkansas Art Center's website to register for all of these talks, um, which will take place over the next few months. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce to you our speakers today. Ajimu Kojo is a figurative painter and filmmaker who currently lives in Brooklyn, New York. He is a native of Little Rock. He grew up going to the Arkansas Art Center and is a graduate of Central High School. He attended Howard University where he majored in film and television production and minored in theater arts. He splits his time between developing independent film projects, working as a scenic artist on television and film projects, and concentrating on his fine art. We are also joined today by Tony Fennessy Weber, who's a park ranger at Little Rock Central High Historic Site. Thank you both for joining us today. And I am going to turn things over now to Tony. Okay, hello, good afternoon. I have been at Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site for six years. There we interpret the history of the 1957-1958 school year in which the Little Rock Nine desegregates Central High School. Um, today we're talking about the Will Counts photos. And I'm just here to give you a background on what led up to that photo on that day. Um, Little Rock becomes the focal point of the civil rights movement, actually what people say the catalyst of the civil rights movement. And it's because of the pictures and the film that was taken, that were taken on those days. Um, Elizabeth Eckford becomes one of the most recognizable of the Little Rock Nine because of the Will Counts photo on that special day. Um, in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education is argued before the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court rules it is unconstitutional to, prep, to separate public schools based on race. Um, Brown v. Board sets the tone for the civil rights movement, but very few, few schools integrate right after Brown v. Board. Three years later, Little Rock School District becomes the largest school district to integrate thus far. And at the heart of this, you have nine kids who volunteer to desegregate the school. They send a, um, a volunteer form to the All Black High School asking, who wants to desegregate Central High School? And 200 students originally signed up to desegregate Central, but only nine decide and only nine actually get inside the building. The first thing they did, they checked their grades, they checked their behavior records, they checked their, in, their attendance records, they interviewed their teachers, and they interviewed the principal. After that, they have a list and they interview the students. And in that interview, the school board and the superintendent of the Little Rock School District tells the African-American students, if you come to Central High, you cannot participate in any extracurricular activities. You have to find your own way to school. 
school each day and you have to remain nonviolent the entire school year. After that, 17 still want to come to Central High, but then their names and addresses are published in the newspaper. And that's when parents get involved because they start getting threats to their home. They start getting threats to their property. They start getting threats to their job. And after all that, you only have nine who actually enter inside the building. Now, the first day comes, but the first but the day before the first day of school, the governor of Arkansas, Oral Fathers, had a live press conference. And in that press conference, he stated that he had evidence that thousands of people had armed themselves with guns and knives. And he's afraid if the African-American students get inside, there will be blood in the streets. Therefore, he has deployed the Arkansas National Guard to preserve peace and order outside of the school. Now, hearing this news, the superintendent tells the Little Rock Nine, and don't come to school on the first day. He's not sure in the environment. Now, the first day of school comes, and there are not thousands of protesters out there. There are only about 200, and the National Guard have the school completely surrounded. And so the superintendent tells the Little Rock Nine, come to school on the second day, but do not bring your parents. He says he is promised the, the children they will be safe because they'll be inside the school and they'll be behind the National Guard. But he says your parents may not be safe as they walk home or they walk to their cars. So he tells the students to come alone. Now, Daisy Bates, she is the Arkansas State chapter president of the NAACP, and she's also the mentor of the Little Rock Nine. She hears they're, they're finally going to school, but they have to go to school alone, and she doesn't feel comfortable with them going to school by themselves, so she calls four ministers to walk with them. Two of the ministers are white, and the other two are black, and he, she's hoping that the ministers walking with the students will stop anyone from physically attacking them, but it's three o'clock in the morning when she comes up with this plan, and she gets in contact with all of the Little Rock Nine except for two. Two of them never got the message to meet up with Daisy Bates and the rest of the kids, and two of them come to school by themselves. And the first one to arrive there was Elizabeth Eckford at 15 years old. Now, when she got there, she saw the crowd, but most of the protesters are directly in front of the school, so she decides to use a side entrance. But as she approaches the guardsmen there on that entrance, they stand in her way. They won't let her pass. Elizabeth tries to explain to them that she's enrolled in Central High, and eventually a soldier just points to the side, and Elizabeth thinks he's telling her to go through another door. And so she has to go in front of the school, and that's when the reporters spot her, and that's when the protesters spot her. And in that picture, you see her walk down the street as she's trying to get inside of Central. And she says people were yelling at her, calling her names, saying, go back to Africa, you don't belong here. But she's just still trying to get into the school. She tries two more times to enter the school, but each time the National Guards going to block her way. And she said that's when the panic starts to set in. And she says she scratched. She scanned the crowd to try to find a kind face, and she locked eyes on an older lady who appeared to be nice. But when that lady looked at her, she spat on her. As Elizabeth continued to walk down the street, people continue to spin on her and call her names. And someone yells in the background, go get a rope. Elizabeth's just trying to get to the bus stop. She finally gets there. She said the reporters kind of form a cocoon around her. And she said because the reporters kind of shifted around her, no one physically touched her on that day. But because of those photographs and that film, that live television film, Elizabeth Eckford's images go all over the world. And this is the first look of race relations in the United States. The first big news stories that come out of the United States was number one, Sputnik. Uh, the number one, the first two news stories, period, was Sputnik and then the Little Rock Central High School crisis. This was the first time you could live stream television. And if you didn't live in the United States, even if you didn't live in the South, you may not know what was happening in the United States, but people all over the world are watching. And Elizabeth got letters and gifts from people all over the world encouraging her to keep up the good work, keep up the fight. And these images, and particularly this one with her and a young lady named Hazel, she's the young lady right behind Elizabeth that yell, that's yelling at her, that, Hazel, that becomes the symbol of the civil rights movement. And it proves two things for the movement. Number one, the media was a very powerful tool in the civil rights movement. News broadcasts, live footage, 
kind of forced the president's hand. What are you going to do when the world is watching you? And also young people, young people become the backbone of the movement. John Lewis says all the time he watched the Little Rock Nine on television as a child in 1957. And that inspired him to be an activist, to know that teenagers ages 14 to 17 years old can make a huge difference in this world. But it started with these nine young folks in 1957. Now, all the Little Rock Nine are still with us, except for one, only one has passed on. Elizabeth Eckford still lives here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, she speaks regularly, but she didn't speak for 40 years. And the reason why um, that photo becomes internationally famous and she does not own the rights to that photo. So can you imagine you think you're about to die and someone takes a picture of you? And for the next 60 something years, people keep on asking you about that moment over and over and over and over again. So she didn't speak for almost 40 years. But on the 40th anniversary, she finds she finally finds the, the, the power and the courage to speak. And she speaks all the time. And she tells people, if you don't tell your story, other people will tell it for you. So um, she comes by regularly to the site to speak to groups. And also the young lady behind her, Hazel Bryant, the one with her mouth open, she was 15 years old too on that day. And six years after this photo was taken, she actually called to apologize to Elizabeth. And um, she says she didn't want her children to remember her that way. And she said her life is more than one moment. She said she is more than the worst thing she ever did. Um, but like I said, neither one of these ladies own this photograph. And so this is something they still deal with today. And so I just add all that to make people remember the civil rights movement wasn't that long ago. Most of the people we talk to are kids and they're like, ah, that's ancient history. Like, no, it's not ancient history. These people are still with us. And the things they were fighting for in 57, they're still fighting for today. And that's why they still speak to people all over the world still to this day. But um, thank you for letting me share this little spiel about the, the history of their photograph. And I'll be around afterward for questions as well. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. Um, before I get started, well, first and, for, first and foremost, I want to thank everybody that's tuning in. My name is Acha Mukojo. Um, this is the, the piece behind me is the, is the work that we are discussing today. Um, but before I get started, there are a couple of people that I would like to thank. Uh, I want to thank Raina Edgar, uh, Lindsay Knight, uh, Tony Weber. I want to thank the Arkansas Arts Center, uh, Brian Lang, Stephanie Fetter, the Historic Arkansas Museum, the Thea Foundation. I'd like to thank the Akansa Gallery, uh, the Argenta branch of the William F. Lehman Library, and all those uh, involved and associated with the Arkansas Art Center. So, uh, the first thing I'd like to do is, like I, like I mentioned already, I am from Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and I went to Little Rock Central High School. Now, the reason, the reason why participating in this exhibition was so important to me is because some of the first exposure I had as an artist comes from the Arkansas Arts Museum. Um, and I wanna, I wanna kinda go right into that with this image here. This is a portrait of Salvador Dali. And the title of the portrait is called Envelopes Us More. Um, the reason why this has left such a lasting impression on me as an artist is because this is one of the first things that I ever saw as a youth at the Arkansas Art Center. I don't know if it's still there or not, but as a youth, I would spend summers and um, weekends taking classes uh, at the Arkansas Art Center. Um, and I would always come back and I would look at this photograph. Uh, in this photograph, seven women, seven new, new women are expertly arranged. 
to resemble a macabre skull. Now Ali stands next to the skull, eyeing the viewer in all of his surrealist weirdness. So like this was something that just like left a lasting impression on me and it, it really sucked out. And it's one of those things that uh, it had me going back to the museum and uh, becoming more interested in photography and drawing and painting. And um, the, Arkansas Arts, the Arkansas Arts Museum was the foundation, like I said, of my, of my artistic career. So, you know, this is just, um, this is just one of those things that's very important to me as a young artist. Um, as was mentioned, I attended Little Rock Central High School, uh, which is, um, well, what can I say about that? Just to give you context, I walked, I entered the halls of Little Rock Central High School 34 years after the Little Rock Nine integrated Little Rock Central High School. Um, just to give you some context of what that means to me as a student there in 91. This is Little Rock Central High School. It was, uh, it was also called the most beautiful high school in America at the time. I still believe it to be true. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. The high school is, absolutely gorgeous it's huge it's got the reflection pool at the base of the steps um i think my graduating class was 500 students i believe that it was a total of almost 2,000 students that attended the high school while i was there so um it's uh it's quite an amazing building and I'm very proud to have gone to this high school being the, being the fact that it was integrated. It was the first integrated high school in the United States. Um, okay, let me um, let me piggyback off of a little bit of what Tony has already shared with us in terms of history. Um, well, here's an image of the nine students. Uh, the Little Rock Nine was a group of nine Black American students enrolled in Little Rock Central High School in 1957. Uh, their enrollment followed by the Little Rock crises in which the students were initially prevented from uh, entering the racially segregated, segregated school by Old Father, the governor of Arkansas at that time. Um, it's been reported when the photograph of Elizabeth Expert by Will Counts was made, when it made the front page of the Arkansas Democrat and Arkansas Gazette at that time. This is what, um, this is what uh, prompted Dwight D. Eisenhower to send the, uh, the 101st Airborne to intervene on behalf of the United States government to enforce integration into Little Rock Central High School. Uh, as Tony stated, Eisenhower sent in um, federal troops to escort the nine students into Little Rock uh, Central High School, at which point it drew national attention and was the catalyst which led to the civil rights movement. Those students' names are Melba Patillo Bill, Minnie Jean Brown, Elizabeth Eckford, Ernest Green, Gloria Ray Colomart, Carlotta Walls Lanier, Selma Mothershed, Terrence Roberts, and Jefferson Thomas. Now, this is what a lot of people don't really like take into consideration, which if you look at this photograph right here, you can you can tell that they were, these were teenagers. We're talking 15, 16 year olds. This image in particular, I find interesting because right there in the center of the frame is um, Minnie Jean Brown. And you can see her, what looks to be playfully saluting the photographer. I mean, it just shows you how young these children 
were during this time of such racial disharmony. Um, here's another shot. The caption reads, Minnie Jean Brown, 15, arrived with the other members of the Little Rock Nine outside Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957, as members of the 101st Division of the Airport, Airborne Command stand ready to protect them. So just to give you more insight on the situation that was going on during that time. Um, you know, it's like, think, think back to what you were doing when you were 15 years old and put yourself in these students' shoes and think about the types of things that they were having to deal with in terms of like, walking the halls of this school and being harassed and go escorted. There were times where, you know, the federal troops couldn't follow these female students into the restroom. And, you know, story has it that I believe Minnie Jean Brown was like attacked in the bathroom by the students. So they weren't always surrounded by their protectors. Um, and, you know, we learn these things in the home. So these, their, their classmates were being taught untruths about them. And the aggression was being acted upon them because of the things that they learned in the household. Um, so anyway, I say that to say that this is the, this is the high school that I graduated from in, in 93. Uh, of course, things were a lot different then, but as my career progressed in the art world and in the film world, one of the catalysts or one of the inciting incidents that led me to pursue such a career was a film that was shot in Little Rock in 93 called The Ernest Green Story, based on the first graduate of Little Rock Central High School, Ernest Green, starring Morris Chestnut. Now, this was um, this was very important to me as an aspiring artist because I got I got a chance to see a production crew come into my city, where I believe at the time the population of Little Rock was maybe 125,000. You know, um, so. Everybody got involved. And to reenact that year, 1957 in Little Rock was, uh, to say the least, very interesting. Um, and so I got a chance to see how a film was produced. I got a chance to see how actors portrayed these real life events. And, um, this was definitely one of the moments that sparked my interest in, uh, in filmmaking. And so, you know, not to spend too much time on it, I went, I attended Howard University, I majored in film, uh, I minored in theater. So there were, there were, you know, there was a lot of time to spend writing screenplays and shooting films and directing them and learning about cinematography and that sort of thing. Um, but it's in, I've always been an artist. So, that was always there. That was the undercurrent of, of who I was and what I was to become. Um, so, you know, postgraduate, I um, I found a way to to marry my interest in filmmaking and painting. And over the course of a num over the course of a number of years, um, I became a member of the United Scenic Artists Union. 829, which uh, led me to, um, or afforded me the ability to work on like many, many films, many television productions, music videos, you name it. Uh, and initially I was working as a production assistant and then I worked my way into, you know, various departments. I worked in wardrobe, I worked in, um, uh, I worked in the camera department, you know, I worked on the set. And one day I saw someone painting a portrait on the set and I was very curious as to what that was because like I said, in the back of my mind, art was always there. So I asked them what it was that they did and they said, well, this is 
called scene painting, which is something that I didn't really learn at Howard, um, but I had somewhat of an understanding. So that was um, that was a career that I pursued and am currently working working as a scenic artist in the film industry. So it's a nice combination of being able to work in the film industry and work as an artist. Um, so let me fast forward to 2018. I was uh, invited by the Sheen Center in um, New York, New York to curate a show on the Little Rock Nine. Now at the time, I don't even, it was on the heels of a, a solo exhibition that I had there um, entitled Black Wall Street, A Case of Reparation. So on the heels of that show and the success of that show, I was invited back to curate a group show. And so I chose nine artists to participate in the show. And we um, exhibited work in conjunction with a stage production. And it was at that time that I finally got to meet um, I think seven of the Little Rock Nine were in attendance. So I got a chance to meet them. And that's what led me to produce, well actually, yes, in a sense, that's what led me to produce the painting that you see over my shoulder, Wakanda Don't Cry. Um, and uh, let's talk about that. Um, you know, before, before I, before I speak on that, I want to talk a little bit about my time uh, in Austria. So before all this, I, um, I spent about a month and a half in Austria learning a technique that I now use in my paintings called the niche technique, which, is, which basically translates to the mixed technique, uh, where paintings are developed, um, the underpainting is developed in tempera, and it's overpainted with oil glazes. So the idea is that the, uh, the powder pigment, the white powder pigment of the tempered paint allows for the whitest white to shine through underneath the oil glazes. So you build the painting up back and forth between the, um, the water-based egg tempera paint and the oil glazes that rest on top of it. And so the light, the idea of light refraction bouncing off the canvas back to your, back to your field of vision, creating this luminous um, work in which you see here. So um, back to the group show. So I, I came up with this painting. Um, well, you know what? That, that photograph of Will Count was always in the back of my mind. Um, because it was such a, it is such a monumental moment in Little Rock Central High School's history. I'm going to read a brief statement about the painting, and then I'll continue to, to uh, share some more information. The portrait reimagines Elizabeth Eckford in the context of contemporary pop culture to celebrate her action and transform the, percept the perceptive of the racially charged incident. Uh, the painting's title is a nod to both Warriors Don't Cry, the searing memoir of the battle to integrate Little Rock Central High School by Melville Priscilla Bill, and a nod to the film Black Panther, where um, Wakanda's royal family is protected by an all-female guard known as the Dora Milaje, also known as the Adored One. The portrait depicts Eckford as a Dora Milaje warrior, carrying both spear and school books as she braves a jeering crowd. Um, as Tony mentioned earlier, Hazel Mastery is in the background, uh, and she is somewhat prominent in this composition. And as um, Eckford walks into the Central High School, I'm using the blend of the iconic photograph and contemporary pop culture to transform the incident and to lionize Eckford's bravery. Uh, Will Count said that she never lost her composure. Um, she remained dignified and determined in what she was doing. And so, you know, I wanted to take that moment and I wanted to transform it into something that 
honored her, honored all of the Little Rock Nine students because of what they did and what they provided for, you know, the generations to come. I would not have been able to attend Little Rock Central High School if it weren't for these nine students. I can't imagine what they dealt with and what they must have gone through um, during that that year that they were um, in attendance. So what I wanted to do with this painting is create a narrative to where uh, Elizabeth is draped in armor and she is protected. And I manipulated the background in such a way to where she is prominent and they are not. Because for someone to be able to withstand that type of uh, that type of pressure is, is unimaginable. Um, and so, yeah. Anyway, that's that's what this painting means to me, and that's um, that's what Elizabeth Eckford means to me in terms of the civil rights movement and American history. Um, so yeah, there you have it. <laughs> I wanna, I wanna say that um, all of these, this imagery, all of these image, all of these images, and this imagery is still very important and very prevalent. Um, just last week, we had a president who decided to host his first rally in a city where an estimated 300 African Americans were brutally slaughtered in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, so what? I mean, what does that mean? You know, what? What? What's really going on? Where a man can, you know essentially lynch another man in the witness of other people by extending his leg on another person's neck for almost nine minutes. Um, where, where are we right now in terms of like race relations in America? I think that this painting is still very telling of you know, how we're dealing with each other, how we're not addressing the real issues that are still um, a huge problem in this country. So um, that being said, I open the floor to questions. Thank you so much, Ajumu. We do have a question here. Someone has asked, you may have mentioned this already, but what was your thought process behind the muted palette? I wanted to add some color, but I did not want it to be in full color. Um, so I created a, I guess, some, somewhat of a daguerreotype or a sepia tone painting. Um, I wanted it to have a vintage feel, but also, you know, evoke the idea that it is contemporary. The fact that she, you know, her garb is, her garb is contemporary, but she's still placed in the time that was, you know, over 50 years ago. So it was just a manipulation of uh, time and space. I should move. This is Carrie Carr. We went to high school together. Hi, Carrie Carr. How are you doing? Good, I've been following you uh, and all of your wonderful work. But I just had a question 
what made you want to go to Austria and learn that particular technique? And what years was that? That was back in 2005. And the reason being, like most artists will tell you, um, you know, you become hyper aware of the work that influences you. And that leads you down the road and you start picking out different artists that you, um, whose work that you, you admire. And there was one artist in particular um, whose work I was introduced to through jazz music. My grandfather was a huge jazz enthusiast. And so I used to, um, I used to venture down into his, his little man cave or private area and he would have a collection of jazz albums and of which uh, one I believe was Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. That same album I later was listening to in my college years over a friend's place. And I couldn't get that image out of my, my head. Um, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the, uh, the artwork, I suggest you go check it out. Um, but it was just, it was trippy. And I couldn't stop looking at it. And I wanted to, eventually I was like, I want to paint like this guy or who this artist, I didn't know it was a man at the time. And so my, my research led me to find out who it was. Uh, the artist's name is Matty Carvine. Uh, Matty was um, German and Jewish. His father was, his, his mother was German, his father, I'm sorry. His father was um, Jewish, his mother was German. And um, you know, I just thought he was dope. You know, uh, for lack of a better expression, his work just like really spoke to me, and I wanted to like mimic it. And that's like what most artists do when they first start out; they they just start to paint like their favorite artist. Um, and so, you know, through research, I was like, what like what is the style? What is it about these paintings that are so different from other oil paintings and acrylic paintings that I've seen in the past? And so I found out there was this thing called niche technique, and I was like, well, what is what is that? Like, what is the niche technique? And so I started doing research online and I found someone that taught the technique who eventually became my maestro, my professor, um, Philip Jacobson. So I got in touch with him. He says, Oh yeah, I'm in Texas. You know, I, you know, I teach the technique, blah, blah, blah. You can, you can come and learn. I was like, great. You know, there's nothing for me to get, a, you know, well, not nothing, but like this is, this was, this was doable. And he says, but I teach. <laughs> I teach my school, I teach the technique in Austria. So I was like, okay, well, <laughs> now I have to figure out how to get to Austria to learn this technique. Um, so, you know, like with most things, you learn it, you file it, you exercise it, and then over time, you develop your own style. So that's, that's, that's what I'm in the process of doing, developing my own, my own flavor. But yeah, I had to, um, I had to travel far and wide to, to learn this technique, but um, it was it was worth it. I really enjoyed it. It it, it lends itself to my meticulous nature. And as you may imagine, uh, in the future, you will have your own student or students. You know, I've been thinking about it seriously. I you know, it's like why not? It's fun if somebody's interested. If they like the look of the work, you know, um, then. By absolutely, like that's the, that's the whole point of like learning something is to like pass along the, the knowledge. So, right. um, if there's anybody out there and they're interested, like hit me up because uh, I love sharing information. Well, I'm very proud of you, and hopefully, uh, we can all see you for the next reunion. <laughs> Thank you so much. We have another question from the chat. Uh, someone has asked. Do you feel when you were going to school at Little Rock Central High School, do you feel that the true full history of the Little Rock Nine was taught? Well, I mean, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I, you know, I guess it's kind of relative to, by, to what you mean by the, the true full history. Um, the history is taught, at least it was when I was there. Um, you know, I was there at a time where, um, like I said, the, the film was produced. I believe Clinton was 
Uh, he wasn't president. He was the president elect. Um, the short the short answer is is absolutely like it's it's one of the things that people go to Little Rock, Arkansas to check out is to look at that school to like see what and like when you get there it's like wow it's majestic how how large that school is you know you can't even really describe it in, uh, in words or in in photographs. Um, so for me, yes, as I walked down the halls, I, I, I thought about that. I, you know, that was, was it constantly on my mind? No, but like, that was something that I always thought about. Like, wow, I, I'm attending the high school where the Little Rock Nine, in, the Little Rock Nine integrated. Like that's, that's major. Um, so yeah. Okay, we can take two more questions. Uh, I have one ready. Can you tell us about what you are working on presently? Uh, and are you pulling from current events? So what are your current projects right now? Uh, yeah, so that's where the, um, the filmmaking comes in into play. As an artist, I, uh, I'm a storyteller. I love telling stories and I feel like strong work always has a strong story at, at its foundation. So, you know, I don't wanna, you know, as um, Francis Bacon said, you know, the job of the artist is to maintain the mystery. So I don't wanna give away too much information, but I am working on a piece of self portrait, which I never do uh, for a group show later, later this year, sometime in August. And I am developing a um, I'm developing a series. Um, you know what? I don't even want to talk about that yet. But what I what I will share with you is I have a couple more slides here. I'll just run through them real quick. I won't. I know we repressed the time, but I just want to share some of the images from the Black Wall Street series because that is so relevant today. Even uh, these are some older images. Um, so this is an ongoing series that I've been working on. Um, and as you can see in the titles, this is Dr. Olivia J. Hooker, the first African-American woman to enter the U.S. Coast Guard. She was also one of the last survivors of Black Wall Street. Uh, and I got a chance to meet her in 2016 and speak with her. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Um, to sit down and have a conversation with her and listen to her speak. Um, and so this series of paintings uh, are meant to evoke a reimagining of the opulence that the black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma carried with them uh, during the time prior to the massacre. Um, and so there's that. But you know, I, I do have a couple of things in the pipeline. Um, uh, like I said, I have the, I have the self portrait going and that is going to speak to current events in regards to what's happening with, um, the rebellion and, um, police brutality, um, because it matters because black lives matter. Um, <clears throat> and, um, I have another series that I'm not at, at yet ready to speak on. So yeah, got some things working, cooking up some stuff. Someone had asked about your use of gold leaf. And honestly, I was wanting to ask about it as well. Uh, they asked, can you speak to the specifics of why you chose to use gold leaf in your work? I, because it reinforces um, royalty. Like one of the artists that I, uh, am influenced by Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, and if you look at the portrait of Dr. Hooker, you can see that I've included the crown at the center of the painting to, um, to rein reinforce that regalness. Um, it's, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. One of my other favorite painters, Barclay Hendricks, used it a lot in his portraits. Um, and honestly, it's, it's just, it's cool. I mean, you know, it, it looks, it looks great. It looks great. And if, and if used correctly, whatever that means to you, it, it really helps to, um, 
to uh, enhance the work, in my opinion. Uh, I don't always use it, but when I do, I try to use it in a way that it's not just arbitrary, that I'm using it to, to make a statement. Hi, can I jump in here? Absolutely. Hey, Ajmu, it's Julie. Hey, Julie, how you doing? Good, how you doing? That was really, uh, I just wanted to say that um, you're already a, a teacher of sorts because I've known you for many years and known your work and I learn more and more each time. So your teaching has already begun. Um, my question to you was, uh, and you know, I don't, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I don't know if you think about this, but as far as the Little Rock Nine, do you see any um, kids or, you know, uh, young twenty-year-olds, uh, sort of those heroes of today, and what's going on? Any people in particular, or groups, or have you has that entered your mind? Um, you know, off the top of my head, well, absolutely, you know. That's my friends even, kids on my block even, kids out in the street protesting. Um, you know, the youth are out here doing it. They're out in the street. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I saw this. I'm gonna call it a commentary. I'm not gonna call it a stand-up. The Dave Chappelle Hill was in the last two weeks. One of the things that he said really stood out to me. He said, you know, any black person that can survive this shit on a daily basis is a hero. And I, I agree with that 100%. Can you say that again? Any black person that can survive this shit on a daily basis is a hero. This is psychological warfare that's happening right now. I'm not going to get into the, you know, the, too far into it because, you know, um, I cannot confirm nor deny it. But in my neighborhood and in many neighborhoods across the nation right now, there's like an exorbitant amount of firecrackers being released into the air from into the wee hours of the morning, and it's 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 kind of like playing a game on you psychologically and some people suggest that it's being done this way so that there are many restless nights and so that there will not be any protesting in it you know it's just like all this kind of like you have to question what's going on right now you know you have to question like why this is happening shortly after people are talking about the funding to the police and what that really means and why it's being misconstrued and misinterpreted and and and, and sent out there as misinformation by Donald Trump and his, and his administration. You know, these things are perpetuated and um, people that aren't willing to do the work and research and think are just accepting what's being said as gospel. So, you know, when you have, when you have the youth out here That are doing that are playing their part i consider them heroes yeah i consider them an extension of the nine students that entered that that high school not knowing not even knowing how much of an impact or maybe they did how much of an impact this would have you know and i feel like it's my it's my right because i choose to do it to share this information because if we don't share it, then it's gonna get lost. And, you know, that cannot happen because history tends to repeat itself. And if we're supposed to be this, this great nation that's being touted as, as being, then let's really become what we say that we are. 
and you can't continue to have black men and women and children murdered and nobody being held accountable and call yourself a great nation. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, but that's how I feel about it. Thank you. That was great. You're welcome. Well, that's there any I wanted to uh, to extend a comment, an observation of this uh, of this piece, if I could, real quick. Uh, this uh, the Wakanda don't cry. Um, not to take the conversation too too far back, but just noticing the use of not just the costuming of the Domalaje's uh, warrior uh, outfit on this student, but the spear, the spear. If you recall in the movie. Um, Black Panther, that spear would ring whenever the ladies, the warriors would stamp this spear on the ground, it would ring and just this kind of um, energy uh, uh, that you feel listening to the sound effect um, of that commanding uh, spear. If you recall in the beginning of the movie, uh, Black Panther, when they walked into the apartment, to see um, the uh, the Wakandan uh, who's out there, uh, and the the two warrior women stamp came in the room and they stamped their spear, and then the, the king would appear. It was a very powerful, powerful way to kind of introduce the um, not just the the majesty, but just again the power itself that these people commanded. And looking at this use of this imagery in this piece, this historical photograph, it's just, it's just, it's well, it just marries so well. You can see the people in the background being muted by this steely kind of composure that this young lady has walking to school with her books. I mean, this is just so dope. So I just wanted to offer that commentary, man. A very, very powerful piece, brother. Thank you, thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Well, I think we're at our, our hour mark and I wanted to just say thank you to everyone who attended. And um, you know, this was our first virtual talk. And so thank you for bearing with us as we worked through some technical difficulties and figuring things out as well. I can't thank you enough for this talk. I think it was extremely powerful and um, loved learning more about your work and you as an artist. And um, I, I hope that you will work with the Art Center again in the future. Thank you so much. And um, on behalf of everyone at the Art Center, um, just thank you for participating in this talk today. Well, thank you. I want to thank everyone again who is involved in, in, in making this happen, this talk happen, also in um, and, uh, creating the space for artists to exhibit their work uh, through the Arkansas Arts Center. Again, I want to thank my, 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 my co-partner in crime today, Tony Weber, and also I want to thank Lindsay Knight, who has been such a, a great help to me throughout this entire process, and also um, you, Raina, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, we're just going to keep doing it. We're going to keep doing it to death. So um, if you want to, oh, real quick, um, I want to let everybody know that the virtual gallery is now up. So if you want to see these works online, you can. And all the work, including this one, is available for sale. Um, you got to throw that in there. You know, it is what it is. Um, so these works are for sale. You would be supporting um, many great foundations and you would be supporting many great artists whose work um, deserves a place to live. Um, and I, if, with that, if you're looking for me on social media, I am Ajamu, that's spelled A-J-A-M-U, Kojo, K-O-J-O. And uh, my website is ajamukojo.com. So, with that, I say thank you all. And if there's anything else anybody wants to say, speak now or forever hold your peace. 
Well, I can say, Ajimu, I have been just thrilled for the opportunity to get to know you and get to know your artwork. And I am so happy that you entered the Delta in the first place and your work is so powerful. And honestly, at this time, it it is very timely, but it's also timeless. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I appreciate those comments. I'll give it back to you, Raina. All right, well, if there are no comments, we're gonna close out the meeting. Thank you all for attending today.